with all of the conversation in the news about limiting physical contact and alternative ways to shake hands, an older colleague of mine shared with me a story about the first time that he passed the piece in 1978 when it was first introduced in the Lutheran Book of Worship, you know, the old green book. Prior to this, sharing of the peace was not a particularly common practice in Lutheran congregations, and it had never been done before in this particular congregation of very stoic and reserved German Lutherans. So in as warm and encouraging of a voice as he could muster, the pastor said, the peace of the Lord be with you all. And also with you. And also with you. <laughs> try that again. No, no, no. You did much better than they did the first time. They kind of just mumbled, and also with you. And he stepped bravely out from behind the altar. The pastor went forward to the front row to shake the hand of the first woman that he came in contact with there and greet her. Now, she happened to be someone who came only infrequently, and she always snuck out of the service during the last hymn. The moment that his hand touched hers, though, her face just crumbled and her eyes filled with tears, and she ran out of the building by the side door. That was not the response the pastor was expecting. It was all he could do to finish the service, and as soon as he could, he went over to her house to check on her. Well, she politely invited him, him into her living room and told him, I'm so sorry I made such a scene, Pastor. You see, since my husband died five years ago, you're the first person that has ever touched me. There are many people in the world today who are yearning to be touched, looking for someone to reach out to them, to make contact with them. And so even as we take genuine precautions to limit the spread of germs, I am mindful now, maybe more than ever, that our world is full of hurting, lonely, and scared people needing to be touched and healed. It's also why this gospel reading is especially important today. Because in it, we hear the story of a time when Jesus touched a life through a simple conversation. It starts with a Samaritan woman at the well at noon, which is the wrong time to be at the well. One doesn't go to the well in the heat of the day if you don't have to, and yet she's there. In a phrase that's become very popular this past week, she's been forced to socially distance herself. She's been isolated. Now, she's not trying to do this because she has some sickness or because she's trying not to get sick. She's been isolated because she's a Samaritan, and Jews aren't supposed to even speak to them. She doesn't have a name, and she's socially disgraced because she's had more than one husband. In fact, she's had five husbands, and we don't know why. But actually, it doesn't matter, other than the fact that at this time in history, a woman had to be married in order to survive. Not to thrive, but simply to survive. So she's an interesting woman, to say the least. One of the most interesting things about her is that she asks questions of Jesus, not just one, but several, as you heard Pastor Cassie and Frank going back and forth. Given her status in life and her being at the well at noon instead of earlier in the morning, most anyone would have advised her that when she came upon Jesus, she should have just kept her mouth shut and left the church by way of the side door. Instead, She asks Jesus questions, lots of questions, even as she begins to realize who Jesus is, first maybe a prophet and then indeed the Messiah. And she keeps asking questions, 
Even when Jesus offers answers that didn't make much sense, she keeps on asking questions, which creates this sense of connection, which creates this holy and touching conversation. Instead of dismissing or ignoring her, like so many others had already done in her life, Jesus treats this woman like a person who's worth knowing, a person who's worth his time, attention, and respect. Jesus touched her life in that conversation. He talked with her about important things, about God and life and worship and love. And most importantly, he didn't condemn her as others had done. He didn't argue with her about the relative merits of Jewish or Samaritan ways of worshiping the same God. Instead, he offered her an opportunity to change her life. He offered her the living water of God's love. He touched her by going where she was. He touched her by finding a way to bridge the social barriers that separated the two of them. He touched her by letting her know that amid the fragility and isolation of human life, God loves and cares for her no matter what. And he even provided the courage and the reason for her to reach out and reconnect with the same townspeople whom she was isolated from. I think that's the good news for all of us today. That Jesus is still reaching out to us, reaching out with love and acceptance, reaching out to remind us all that there is no social distance between you and God. And Jesus also calls us to reach out to the world around us, to the people around us, and to touch them with that same love of God in Christ. Indeed, at a moment in history when our lives seem to all be in flux, when many feel worried or sad or angry or alone, when it seems like everything that we know and love is being postponed or even taken away from us, we remember that our conversations cannot be canceled. Our relationships cannot be canceled. Phone calls and texts cannot be canceled. Music and reading and prayer cannot be canceled. And most importantly, love and hope cannot be canceled. So this week, I invite you to act like the Samaritan woman and have a touching conversation with at least one other person outside of your normal circle of family and friends. Call or text someone that you haven't seen or heard from in a while. Let them know that you are thinking and praying for them. Share something that you love to talk about with them or reminisce together over a joyful memory. Or if you must, follow Paul's lead from our second lesson and commiserate in your sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope. And hope does not disappoint us because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to each of us. And for that, we all say, Amen.